America Looks Abroad. This is the 56th in a series of broadcasts presented by the staff members of the Foreign Policy Association, a nonpartisan organization which offers accurate information on world affairs. Today's subject is Inside England. The speaker is Mr. James Frederick Green, Foreign Policy Association expert who follows international events in Great Britain. Mr. Green. Good afternoon. Yesterday, an official spokesman of the German Foreign Office condemned the foreign policy of the United States as one of pinpricks, injury, challenge, and moral aggression. And he warned that the recent appeal of the British Minister of Shipping, who asked us to seize the many foreign ships lying idle in our harbors, was inciting America to commit a warlike act. Whatever this very strong statement means with regard to German-American relations, it throws light on Great Britain's position in the war. Germany realizes that Britain can survive only if she has ships to bring food and raw materials to the British Isles, and that only America can provide those ships and war materials to help Britain survive. The British realize this somber fact, too, and only three days ago Winston Churchill warned them that it would be a disaster to suppose that the supreme danger is past. Therefore, the next three or four months may, be, may well be the decisive ones of the war and may place Britain in a precarious situation unless American aid, about which Germany has protested, is forthcoming. On the credit side of Britain's ledger are the une unexpected events in the Mediterranean, where British sea, land, and air forces have scored heavily in North Africa and Albania. For the first time since the war began, somebody has put a large question mark on the claims of the Axis powers to be invincible. Also on the credit side of the ledger, Britain is far better prepared to resist invasion than it was last summer. But the threat of invasion has not disappeared with the coming of the winter weather. In his speech last Thursday, Mr. Churchill said, the watchword must be unceasing vigilance. So much for the favorable aspects of Britain's position. And there can be no doubt that in many ways Britain has made extraordinary progress since the fall of France last June. But on the debit side of the ledger, certain unfavorable factors loom very large. They have to do with airplanes, ships, and industrial production, and the effect of these three items on civilian morale. The airplane problem can be stated very simply. Britain had enough fighter planes, pilots, and anti-aircraft guns last September to stop mass bombing attacks by daylight, and thus to save London from disaster. Britain therefore fulfilled the first task of aerial defense, but it has not yet been able to solve the second problem, the night bomber, nor have the British been able to launch a really large-scale air offensive against the Axis powers. The RAF has undoubtedly done severe damage to Germany and Italy, but Germany, now that it controls most of Europe, is far less vulnerable to air attack than the compact little British target across the Channel. Not until Britain gains superiority over Germany in planes and plane production, especially bombers, can it hope for victory. According to some estimates, Britain's airplane production reached a record peak last August, probably more than 2,000 planes monthly, but then fell off to an average of about 1,700 planes from September through November. Even with imports of American planes added in, this total is still probably well below German production at the present time. Now, the problem of shipping is equally important for Britain. Over four million tons of shipping, British, allied, and neutral, have been sunk so far, and the rate of losses has been increasing in the past few months. In the last two weeks for which we have figures, the two weeks ending December 8th, over 180,000 tons of world shipping has been sunk. If Germany could keep up that rate through 1941, it would sink over four and a half million tons of shipping. Britain can't possibly build ships fast enough to meet its own losses, and many of the other important shipbuilding countries are now under German control. That's why the British welcomed the 50 destroyers we traded them last September, and why they are now buying up every ship they can find in this country, and are planning to build 60 new freighters here. Without imports, Britain cannot feed either its citizens or its machines. Already serious shortages of foodstuffs are developing in Britain, although large surpluses exist in North America and elsewhere, simply because Britain must conserve its shipping for transport of raw materials to its factories 
and perhaps of supplies to its troops in the Mediterranean. The third factor, industrial production, is also of vital significance in Britain's military plans, and of course it depends to a large extent upon the airplane and shipping factors I've just mentioned. All the really interesting figures regarding industrial production are among the most carefully guarded secrets of the various belligerent countries. We can only guess at the damage done to the British economy by Germany's airplanes and submarines. Until the end of September, the Germans seemed to concentrate their bombing attacks pretty largely upon London, and they unquestionably damaged the many industries and communications in and around that enormous city. It was only in October and November that the German bombers went systematically after the great heavy industries in the Midlands at Coventry, Birmingham, and Sheffield. About the only official clue we have as to the results appeared in a recent speech by Mr. Arthur Greenwood, a member of the War Cabinet. Mr. Greenwood stated flatly that all of these air raids had not weakened the essential framework of British industry, but he admitted that they had slowed up what he called the expanding progress of recent months. And Mr. Greenwood went on to say something much more significant, that it would take another two years before Britain could reach the peak of its armament production, and even then, only with the help of the United States. This brings us to the question of civilian morale. What Mr. de Wilde said on this program last Sunday about the German people applies just as forcefully to the British people, that a nation can fight on, even for years, so long as it believes in its own cause and has confidence in an ultimate victory. The British people have certainly exhibited both that belief and that confidence in the last six months. Only a few weeks ago, the British Parliament voted against any consideration of peace by 341 to 4. But the British people realize that victory depends upon airplanes, ships, and hundreds of other implements of war. And they realize with grave anxiety that they can gain supremacy in these weapons only with American assistance. Lord Lothian stated this fact very frankly in the last speech before his death, and he warned the United States that the final showdown might come within the next few months. But the question of American aid, and whether it will come in time to turn the tide, is not only the only issue influencing British morale, the incessant air raids have obviously done appalling damage to civilian life in many parts of England. In the large cities, especially London, hordes of people have to spend every night underground and to face indescribable discomforts and the growing menace of disease. Thousands of Britishers have lost their homes and all their property and have been uprooted from their families and familiar surroundings. Under the circumstances, it's remarkable that civilian morale has not been broken by the despair and resentment that must follow the nightly devastation. But through Parliament and the press, even in wartime, the British public can criticize and condemn the shortcomings of its officials and demand immediate action. Recently, there have been hints of an increase in public resentment over the inadequate shelter facilities in London and the inadequate housing and feeding preparations for air raid victims. The labor leaders in the cabinet, Ernest Bevan and Herbert Morrison, have been going out of their way to attack the Communist Party. They accuse the Communists of fomenting trouble in the air raid shelters and of promoting strikes in the factories. Apparently the Communists are taking advantage of unsatisfactory conditions wherever they find them, and apparently they are finding many such conditions to exploit. Several other questions that affect British morale deserve watching this winter. Winston Churchill has won tremendous popularity as a dynamic, imaginative leader, and his coalition has worked miracles since the dark days of Norway last spring. But the cabinet is still a coalition, a coalition of conservatives, liberals, and laborites, all of whom are patriotically determined to fight the war, but all of whom quite naturally disagree over some of the ways and means of fighting it. They disagree, for example, over taxation and financial policy, over social legislation, and over foreign policy. For example, the business interests in England oppose the excess profits tax of 100% that was enacted last spring. The Labour Party, on the other hand, is not satisfied with the sales tax, which, which went into effect in October, and some of its members advocate a tax on capital wealth. The government has guaranteed a certain income for the railways, so other industries want similar privileges. The government has not yet solved the familiar problem of inflation, 
with both prices and wages rising in the so-called vicious circle. Food prices in England, for example, have risen 25% since the outbreak of war, and clothing prices have risen even more. While many consumers have received higher wages, especially in the arms factories, many others have been severely hit by the rise in the cost of living. Moreover, many liberals and labor leaders argue that this war, like the last one, should be used to promote social legislation, and they are seeking to reform England's school system to help the poorer classes. Yesterday, for example, the heads of the three great churches in England, the Church of England, the Roman Catholic and the Nonconformist faiths, issued a joint statement of war aims, urging that extreme inequality of wealth should be abolished and that every child should have equal opportunity for education and so forth. The liberals maintain that in health, security, and general well-being of the masses is as important in pla as planes and battleships. Just last summer, in fact, Parliament passed legislation to provide one pint of free milk to every poor child under five in England. But many conservatives, on the other hand, fear that Britain is, is rapidly getting socialism without any benefit of an election and that in wartime a nation must curtail every activity except its war effort, which in Britain today is now taking one half of the national income. The larger issues of foreign policy also enter into the picture, while the conservatives and the laborites in the government probably have rather different ideas on such matters as war aims, relations with the Soviet Union and with Franco-Spain, and the question of self-government for India. At least many labor leaders outside the government certainly are quite critical of the foreign policy of Lord Halifax, the new ambassador to the United States, and they demand that Britain go much further in stating its war aims. You will find the best statement of this case in Harold J. Lasky's new book, Where Do We Go From Here? The British Labor Party has officially advocated a federation of Europe, and its most powerful leader in the government, Mr. Ernest Bevin, is strongly in favor of its program for pooling all colonies under an international administration. Now, Prime Minister, Minister Churchill, so far, has maintained that he must concentrate on fighting the war, but he is reported to be preparing a statement of war aims to be delivered next week. All of these many factors play a part in Britain's war effort. From this side of the Atlantic, it is hard to estimate their relative importance from week to week. We can only surmise that the most critical days of the war lie just ahead for Britain, and that the balance of forces between the two great contestants is now very close. Since Britain cannot draw fully upon the vast resources of the British Empire and the United States for another year or more, it may face its real test of strength during the next few months. Dr. James Frederick Green, or rather Mr. Frederick Green, research associate of the Foreign Policy Association, was today's speaker in the America Looks Abroad series. If you would like a free copy of this talk, address your request to the Foreign Policy Association, 22 East 38th Street, New York, or in care of the station to which you are listening. That address is 22 East 38th Street, New York. The Foreign Policy Association is a nonpartisan organization open to all who are interested in American foreign policy. It offers accurate information on current world happenings. In the world of today, foreign affairs are your affairs. We invite you to tune in next Sunday to hear another speaker in the America Looks Abroad series. Today's speaker was Mr. James Frederick Green, research associate of the Foreign Policy Association. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>